Volkswagen is heading toward an all-turbo lineup. Is General Motors working on a cheap electric vehicle? And an inside look at the brand new Chevy Tahoe and Suburban. Strap yourselves in, it's time for Motor Money. <laughs> Hi, I'm Motley Full Analyst Rex Moore and welcome to the worldwide premiere of Motor Money, where all autos all the time and how it relates to you, the investor. My co-pilot on this road trip is Motley Full Senior Auto Analyst John Rosevere, live and in color from somewhere in the great state of Massachusetts. Welcome in, John. Thank you, Rex. All right, we will start things off uh, with headlines from the week all around the world of the autos. Uh, from the Detroit News, the federal government is close to exiting its position in General Motors. The, we're talking about the $49.5 billion bailout of GM that began in 2008 and earned the company the nickname Government Motors. When all is said and done, considering GM's current stock price, taxpayers would come up about $10 billion short. However, Quoting uh, a White House economic advisor, uh, he says that this is actually, the whole auto bailout has turned out far better than anyone could have dreamed of in terms of job creation, the economy, et cetera. John, my first question to you, uh, do you agree that this bailout did turn out very well? I, I think there's no question it turned out well. I mean, GM, Chrysler, and we have to count Ford in this, are all very profitable. Uh, the vehicles have gotten a lot better. They're all still in business. Their suppliers are all still in business. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands of jobs, not just through the Midwest, but, but all over the country and indeed outside of the country as well, uh, that, that were saved by this move. Uh, Alan Mulally, who is the CEO of Ford, told me uh, a couple years ago when I was talking to him, that he felt uh, that this had to happen, this bailout had to happen for Ford's sake. Yeah, uh, he was. He he said, you know, it's awkward to go in front of Congress and testify that they should save your biggest, baddest old competitor. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> but but he felt it was necessary to save the suppliers. And and so I mean, the fact that we have an auto industry now, and we have quite a profitable, strong auto industry that's getting better and better really every quarter, uh, is a result of this bailout. So. I think a lot of people had qualms about it at the time, but I think it's worked out at least as well as just about anybody could have expected, if not a whole lot better than a lot of people expected. And, and for General Motors now, what will it mean that they no longer have the government as an investor? Well, on the one hand, uh, a lot of this was done under the old TARP plan, which was created to save the banks. And, and, and it, back in the dark days of 2008, 2009, the economic crisis. And, you know, if you took money from TARP, you were subject to a whole bunch of restrictions until you paid it back. Restrictions on executive pay uh, and, and a whole lot of perks. Uh, GM, for instance, had to sell off all their corporate jets, what they called the General Motors Air Force. It's all gone. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and this sounds like silly stuff, but GM senior folks have said they've had some trouble trying to hire in senior level executives from other companies because they can't pay them you know, what the market would give them elsewhere. And, and also, I mean, to the extent that any company can justify a corporate jet, I think GM can. This is, a, this is a company with major, major centers of operation in Germany, in Shanghai, and in D Detroit, and with a small senior management team that goes back and forth here. Uh, you know, they fly commercial now and they make it work. But again, to the extent that anybody can justify a corporate jet, GM is that kind of company. So they'd be able to do that as well. On the other hand, um, you know, Treasury has recovered a little over $35 billion of that $49.5 billion. Uh, they've got uh, a little over $4 billion worth of stock left to sell, so that's going to leave them, uh, ballpark guess, about $10 billion short. And uh, I don't know what kind of public uproar we're going to see over that. I, I think it depends on how the administration spends it, and I think it depends on how GM acts. Uh, some have theorized that GM will have to feel obligated, not have to, but will feel obligated to kind of make up some of that difference. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they will or not. We'll wait and see what happens. Um, All right. So that, that, I suppose, is the impact It'll on General Motors. It'll be interesting to watch. A lot of it is we'll wait and see. Now, let's stay with General Motors for a minute. This Detroit News article about a $20 million expansion of GM's Global Battery Systems Laboratory in Warren, Michigan, includes a mention from a GM executive that they're working on a $30,000 electric vehicle with a 200-mile range. And uh, John, you said it's a safe bet. Others are working on this as well. With all this uh, stuff going into the electric revolution, what does this mean for Tesla? 
Well, Tesla, a lot of people look at Tesla and go, oh, they've got first mover advantage. They've got a moat. Uh, I have always looked at Tesla and I've seen a small company with some great technology that is surrounded by a lot of competitors that are just watching and waiting to see what kind of market emerges for these kinds of vehicles. Uh, I, I, I'm not the least bit shocked to hear somebody at General Motors say we are working on, whatever that means, <laughs> an electric car with a 200 mile range that's going to cost 30 grand. I'm sure Ford at some level is working on a similar car and Nissan is and, and Doesn't you know, mean they'll Volkswagen get to it, right? is and everybody else is probably. And it's easy to say you're working on something. It's another thing to, to ship it. Uh, it, it. Tesla has made big claims in the past and they've mostly backed them up so far. So, you know, Tesla says we'll have this car within three years. It'll, it'll be be 200 mile range. It'll be priced like a BMW 3 Series, give or take. So probably a little more than thirty thousand. Uh, you tend to believe them. With General Motors, we'll see. Yeah, I agree. You you had mentioned it was it might even be vaporware for some of these automakers. Well, to some extent, I think it is. I think everybody's waiting for the batteries to get better and cheaper. Uh, I think everybody includes Tesla, and you know, if the batteries get better and cheaper, then these cars will start to appear. And then it becomes who can get the batteries and who has the exclusive deals and so forth. And, and on the one hand, Tesla has good connections with people doing battery research. On the other hand, you know, if it comes to a bidding war, uh, Tesla's not going to compete with the likes of Volkswagen or General Motors. They just, they just don't have the bankroll. <laughs> you, right. know, so it, you know, if there's a limited supply of batteries, uh, this is kind of the thing we see sometimes in the cell phone market where a new chip comes out and then Apple comes in or something and buys up the whole you know, first year's production run of this technology. If these new cheaper batteries are in short supply for the first year or two, uh, it may come down to who's willing to pay for them to get their program started. And, and you know, that, then they're not cheaper batteries anymore, but you know, to get the production going and so forth, somebody may be willing to eat that for a year. But I don't know. So yes, to go back to the question, uh, all of these cars are vaporware till we see them, or at least till we know that the technological advances have been made to make them happen. All right, final headline uh, now, sticking with the Detroit News, Volkswagen appears to be moving toward an all-turbo lineup phasing out conventional gasoline engines within three or four years. John, my first question, please explain to everyone how a turbocharged engine differs from a conventional one. Well, a turbo, is, it's old technology. Uh, the nutshell explanation is it takes the pressure of the exhaust gas and spins a little pump, and that pump squeezes more gas and air into the engine and it makes more power. Originally, these were created, originally in the old days, they were created for fighter planes in World War II. But, you know, they were created for racing cars and so forth. But turbos have, like everything else, become much more refined, more high tech, and now they can be used to get, uh, you know, V6 power out of a four cylinder engine while still getting something pretty close to four cylinder fuel economy. That's the promise of them. Uh, that's why VW sees them as appealing. VW, of course, also has diesels, and, and they're working on hybrids and mm -hmm. electric cars and so forth. But in terms of their regular gas engine, yeah, uh, VW uh, Executive Vice President Mark Trahan did say that they only have three left uh, that they're selling under the VW brand, and those are all set to be replaced by turbos in the next few years. And, and Ford, Ford is also going heavy into this turbo territory. Do you see this as the future, really, for internal combustion engines? I think it's one vision of the future. Uh, Ford did say, uh, Ford VP of Powertrain Engineering did say this week uh, that, you know, th th there are many more turbos in Ford's future. They already have five of what they call the EcoBoost engines, and they have plans for a whole bunch more, and they're finding their ways into more and more Ford models. Not everybody's going this way. I wouldn't say it's the future any more than I would say electric cars are the future or hydrogen cars are the future. I think people are playing, people being research departments and as well as, as you know, the folks who bring these products to market are playing with a lot of different ideas and we'll see what sticks. You know, we'll see what becomes the dominant technology. Right now, you know, the clearest path forward is hybrids. Uh, it, it, because they're dead simple to explain to a, a, a consumer how to operate something like a Prius. You put gas in it when it needs gas. You just put a lot less gas in it. You know, <laughs> it's not complicated to operate. And, and the mass market has climbed that learning curve to the extent that there is one already. So hybrids are easy. And then, you know, plug-in hybrids are just an elaboration of that technology. But, you know, when you run out of gas, you put gas in it. And everybody knows there's a gas station on every corner in town. Uh, 
so this is simple. Hydrogen's a little harder sell. Uh, turbos are a way to get more out of just the gas engine. Um, I don't know of applications that are combining turbos with hybrids. I'm sure we'll see some. Uh, there may be some out there that I'm not remembering at the moment. But like I said, I think this is one path forward. I don't think everybody's sold on it more than any, everybody's sold on electric cars at this point. But I think, I think more and more companies are at least playing with it. GM's got a bunch more turbos that have come out in the last few years. Uh, Volkswagen, of course, has dived into this. We've seen them come from some other folks as well. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be an interesting 10 years or so as everybody sort of figures out where the car as technology goes from here. And there are lots of potential answers right now. And I don't think any of us can say that's the way forward. That's where the industry is going. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And uh, folks, this ride is over. For John Rosevear, I'm Rex Moore. Thanks for joining us for Motor Money. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.